It was the summer of 1980-something, and my brother and I were sitting in Grandpa Wally's station wagon, driving down a country road. True to his character as a social butterfly, he was taking us out on the town to visit somebody important that we didn't know very well. We were going to visit his brother, Uncle Everett. And we were pretty excited because before we got in the car, he told us to get our bathing suits on. I still remember the smell of Bear Lake in the summer. Windows down, we could hear the seagulls. We turned a corner and there it was, the lake, with its many boat docks and cottages. My brother and I were quite happy to learn that we had a great uncle who lived on the lake. We pulled down a street and admired the neighborhood. Beautiful little houses with big picture windows. On one side of the street were the houses, and every home had a little area on the other side of the street where there was green grass that touched the water. And most, too, had a boat dock and a couple of lawn chairs sitting out. Grandpa pulled in the driveway and us kids jumped out, ran across the street and right out into the water. There were little sunfish sailboats out that warm Sunday afternoon with people enjoying life. I recall the water was pretty cold and shallow. We, wa we slowly waded out farther and farther. Before we knew it, we were so far out in the shallow lake that when Grandpa came back out to say, Hey, I want to introduce you to somebody, it probably took us five minutes to wander back to the shore. We pulled ourselves up onto the dock where Grandpa Wally and Uncle Everett were standing and waiting. We looked around for our towels, but had forgotten to bring any. Uncle Everett said he'd be right back. In what seemed like an eternity, standing there with goosebumps, I remind you that this is a Michigan summer and it was probably only 75 degrees out, Uncle Everett returned with a couple of towels. Grandpa Wally officially introduced us. Uncle Everett was a nice man, and he had a really cool house on the lake where we could swim and play. I remember thinking that I was going to like this guy, and truth be told, I did. I still think fondly of him. But as kids, that didn't mean we weren't standing there impatiently. We wanted nothing more than to get back in the water and when we finally got the okay, I remember jumping in and feeling the sand on my feet. I recall in my mind that it was actually sort of weird sand. There was a crust to it, like it was starting to become sandstone. It was evident, even to a kid, that this beach hadn't had anybody playing on it in a while. Grandpa Wally took a seat in one of the lawn chairs to watch over us. Uncle Everett ran back inside for a minute, coming back out with two glasses of iced tea. He and Grandpa sat there and reminisced. Adam and I played. We splashed. We threw mud. We tried to talk Uncle Everett into letting us take his boat out. Fun summer kid stuff. But there was one thing that was weird that I noticed. I remember being way out there in the shallow lake and looking back to see Uncle Everett constantly getting up from his lawn chair again and again to go back inside. I'm sure we complained when it was time to get out of the water, but eventually we agreed. Grandpa said that he wanted to show us the backyard of Uncle Everett's property too. We dried our wet bodies off the best we could and ran barefoot around the yard until Uncle Everett came out to show us his prize-winning garden. I remember eating so many blackberries and wondering why somebody would need so many types of tomatoes. Uncle Everett ran back inside for a few minutes. When he came out, he brought both Adam and me a bucket to collect berries with. But by then, we had had our fill. The afternoon was wearing down and Grandpa said that it was time to go. We picked up our towels that Uncle Everett had let us borrow and our buckets, which by now only had blackberry stains in them. Grandpa led us through the old aluminum back door into Uncle Everett's house. I remember being surprised 
to see him sitting down in his recliner watching TV. I know that he hadn't forgotten that his brother had come by with his grandkids, and so why was he watching TV now, I wondered. He was glued to it for some strange reason, I thought, and this is coming from the kid that tried to glue himself to cartoons whenever he could. Uncle Everett thanked us for coming over and welcomed us back again whenever we wanted. My brother and I thought that that was great. That house on Bear Lake was such a fun place to enjoy life. Back in, in the car, returning home, I remember asking, Grandpa asking what we thought of Uncle Everett. We both agreed that we liked going over there. I asked him, though, why Uncle Everett was always leaving us, going inside for about three minutes, every five minutes that we were there to visit. I don't know if I felt that it was rude, or if I was just confused, or just nosy. Grandpa said, well, Uncle Everett has to look at the ticker every once in a while. What's a ticker, I asked. It's something on the TV that tells him how much his gold is worth. I gave him a funny look because I didn't understand. You see, a few years back, when gold was becoming really valuable, Uncle Everett sunk his entire life savings into it. And right after he did, the market sunk. Ever since then, he's been trying to regain his losses. He can't help but constantly watch the gold ticker to see what's going on. Is that why he kept going inside today? That's why he kept going inside today. Don't think he didn't enjoy your company and watching you kids play. We both did. But Uncle Everett just had something else in his mind that he couldn't let go. We sat in silence the rest of the way home. It was the first time that I think I felt sorry for somebody who had so much. It was sad, especially to a kid, to learn that where he had invested his treasure ruined his quality of life. The gold was always pulling him down and literally away from the real joys of life that he once knew when he had built his lakeside home and began his prize-winning garden. He lost touch with the things that were once so important to him. It was like his gold, which for a brief time brought him such joy, had now become a millstone around his neck, constantly pulling him out of the real world, back to his little glowing box that would tell him how valuable he was. I share this real life story that came to mind, the only memory I have of Uncle Everett, when I recently read a book addressing our gospel reading today. It said, we Christians are called to live and to give generously. It's a matter of our faith. The Bible tells us that what we do with our money and possessions impacts our faith. Notice that I didn't say it might impact our faith. The Bible tells us that it will impact our faith. That impact can be positive, but it can also be negative. The author wrote, My favorite verse in regards to this is Luke 12:34 where Jesus says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. For many years I imagined that it said, Where your heart is, there your treasure will also be. Read that way, the verse means that if I can only get my heart in the right place, then my treasure will follow. And that might be true, but it isn't what Jesus said. Jesus said that what I do with my treasure will cause my heart to go there as well. If I put my treasure with Jesus and his work in the world, that will cause my heart to draw closer to Jesus. 
Conversely, if I put my treasure in things that have nothing to do with Jesus, my heart will be drawn to those things and away from Jesus. It was weird as a kid to feel sorry for somebody who had so much. Uncle Everett had learned the hard way that for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And so he spent his golden years, those years that he had worked so hard for building his house and his garden, sitting inside, watching the gold ticker. I felt bad for him. And I thanked God that I had learned that lesson so early on. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Amen.